All right, so for those that don't know, hello, my name is Ryan DePalma and I'm the Data Systems Associate for the Maven Project, and thanks for joining the session. Uh, this is Dr. Upchurch's uh, education session on lupus, and normally I give a little uh, biography here for Dr. Upchurch, but we're going to keep it short so we have a lot to go through, and I will say that she is very well accredited and is an expert in this field. So Dr. Upchurch, if you'd like to go ahead and get started. Sure. Well, I um, welcome the chance to um, give you some insights into what I find to be a very challenging aspect of rheumatology. I've been a volunteer with Maven since well before I retired, and I'm really impressed with their educational as well as their service uh, orientation. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not, here we go. I have no disclosures. Uh, I did want to start off with some clinical cases very briefly. Uh, just follow quickly. I'm going to go through them and we'll see these again. But they're two 23 year old women. Uh, they have similar stories. The first with an eight month history of diffuse arthralgias, second, a little bit longer. Um, both of them had fatigue. The first patient had malaise and intermittent fever. The second patient had low back pain. The review of systems was negative with regard to the first patient. Um, and with regard to the second patient, she complained of a scaly facial rash, but no photosensitivity, and she was on birth control pills. The first patient was on no medication. The exam of the first patient showed uh, what the observer felt was MCP synovitis, and also what appeared to be some uh, generalized frontal thinning. <laughs> And uh, the exam of the second patient showed diffuse muscle and joint tenderness, uh, not um, confined to localized anatomic structures such as uh, joints. Um, I want you to think about these. I'm getting some feedback. If anybody has their um, audio on, please turn them off. Um, anyway, I want you to think about these cases in terms of what you think is high or low pretest probability. And I would like you to um, think about whether, uh, among other tests, you might consider ordering an anti-nuclear antibody, a rheumatoid factor, um, or um, other tests such as an anti-CCP. And again, we'll come back to these tests um, momentarily. So the objectives of this talk are to review who gets lupus, what distinguishes lupus from other immunologically based illnesses, whether laboratory abnormalities can confirm this diagnosis and how to follow patients with lupus. And finally, um, some advice about when to refer. Uh, whenever I say lupus, of course, uh, it's a very short um, name for a much longer illness named illness, which is systemic lupus erythematosus, but that's a mouthful. So we'll stick with lupus for now. Um, lupus is a prototypic autoimmune disorder. And uh, I will tell you, uh, if you look at this word and sort of get a cold sweat and say, I can't diagnose lupus, I don't know how to do this, don't feel alone because it is very highly challenging to diagnose, even on some occasions to someone who's well-versed in the discipline such as me. And I've had surprises throughout my career of people whom I didn't think had it have it, and then they turned up sometime later with more definitive studies and findings, and they ultimately did. So just pay attention to these slides, and I think this will help quite a bit. Uh, one thing that is very clear about lupus that distinguishes it from many, but not all other inflammatory uh, immunologically based illnesses is it has protean clinical manifestations. So virtually all organ systems can be involved at some time, and it's the mark of the disease, as I'll repeatedly uh, iterate, not to have them all appear at once, but the manifestations occur in stuttering fashion, uh, as well as timing in, in timing and severity. So you have to be a very good observer over sometimes many um, days, weeks, months, or even years. But the thing that's very characteristic of uh, patients with lupus is that they do have uh, anti-nuclear antibodies. And what I did um, put down is something that you will never see in your clinical career, but was the first clue 
many years ago that this was an immunologically based illness. And that is a, a loop, a, what's called an LE cell. And this is actually a nucleus, which is engulfing another uh, antibody coated nucleus. And the result is this LE cell here. And this was the first clue that there were uh, immunologically based aberrations that led to this problem, because this is not a normal finding. You can see a normal poly here, and it certainly doesn't look like that. Um, we can't actually measure for LE cells now, but oddly, um, this is one of, because it's not, it's not actually uh, conducive to the automated laboratory tests that we do these days. And it's very labor intensive and it's also intensive upon, uh, based on the observer. But this particular finding, particularly if it's in serous fluids like pleural fluid or pericardial fluid is pathognomonic of the disease, but we really don't measure uh, these anymore. Okay, let's talk about um, the incidence of lupus. Uh, it's 1.8 to 7.6 cases per 100,000 patient years. Now, in contrast, rheumatoid arthritis is much more common, 40 cases per 100,000 patient years. And what, what this tells you is that you're going to see um, probably uh, up to 30 times more patients with RA in your career than you will uh, lupus. And lupus actually, in some people's minds, is characterized as a rare disease. Um, it can occur at any age but the vast majority uh, occur in uh, childbearing years, 65% uh, between the ages of 16 and 55, with fewer um, occurring in teenage years and even fewer after menopause. Um, it predominantly involves uh, females, and in one study, white females 37 to age 50, but interestingly, black females were younger, 15 to age 44, um, and the same is true with black males versus uh, white males. So this is to say that even though white females and um, black females, in fact, all females of different ethnic and racial groups are affected more commonly than males, uh, you certainly cannot rule out the diagnosis in uh, an individual who doesn't fall inside these demographic groups. Uh, as I said, the, the um, disease severity and manifestations uh, can differ among different groups, American Hispanics, Afro-Americans, Black Africans, Asians, all have differing severity and manifestations. And in fact, the American Hispanics, uh, Afro-Americans and uh, Black Africans and Asians are typically have more severe disease uh, than uh, the other uh, measured groups. So who gets lupus? Um, I have intentionally spared the um, pathophysiologic um, slides that uh, make these talks tedious and long uh, in order to focus on um, things that you can take home with you and remember. But uh, so I'm not gonna tell you uh, that DLR3 and four is most common in lupus, but I am gonna tell you that five to 12% of relatives of patients uh, who have lupus have uh, this disease as well at some time in their lives. And I'm also gonna tell you that um, there's an increased frequency of positive ANAs even without SLE in first degree family members. Uh, interestingly, uh, monozygotic twins have a 25 to 50% penetrance compared to dizygotic twins, uh, which is 5% um, uh, uh, of dizygotic twins. Um, and there's an increased familial incidence of autoimmune disease such as thyroid disease, hematologic disease such as autoimmune hematologic uh, uh, hemolytic anemia and ITP. So uh, it's very interesting and it's borne out by looking at specific genes and by what are called GWAS studies, which are genome-wide um, studies that have been done recently. This is the only pathophysiology slide that I'm gonna show you, but this reminds me to um, tell you that in the setting of the right genetic backdrop, when perturbed by infections and hormones, but also in particular by drugs and environmental toxins, immune dysregulation happens and autoantibodies are formed. And there's a lot of evidence to support the notion that at least some of the clinical features of lupus are actually a result of targeted um, autoantibody uh, uh, pathology. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk specifically about drug-induced lupus because that's the subject of a whole nother hour, but there are a number of drugs uh, that the list of which is growing um, generally every week. Um, but the ones you should be particularly concerned about are antihypertensives um, and also um, the antiarrhythmic antiarrhythmics, um, so such as uh, uh, hydralazine and uh, dilantin. Um, but there are many others, and you can always uh, check them out on uh, um, the up to date and find out what the current list is, which I said is growing regularly. So why is it hard to diagnose? Well, it's a multi-organ system autoimmune disease, and it has clinical and laboratory heterogeneity from patient to patient. Um, there is a lack of pathognomonic, pathognomonic features or tests for the most part, and I am going to mention some um, that can be helpful. Also, the symptoms and findings vary, and they can present independently, as I mentioned, over time at stuttering and irregular intervals when, frankly, you as a physician least expect it. Um, early diagnosis is difficult. There's an inadequacy of features to meet current diagnostic criteria, although as I'll mention at the end of the talk, that's improving with time. And finally, there are, mul there are multiple um, mimics of lupus. So just when you think you have a patient with lupus, she turns out to have something different. We'll go over that briefly as well. Um, well, what about the frequency of manifestations at disease onset in adult patients with lupus? Uh, more than 30% of patients have uh, arthritis and or arthralgias. So remember that arthralgias are, uh, refers to joint pain without physical findings of actual arthritis. Um, fever is common. Photosensitivity, uh, that is, um, uh, aberrations that occur in response to sun exposure is typical, and a malar rash is extremely common. Um, this is at the time of disease onset. Um, less common early manifestations include um, laboratory studies which show leukocytopenia, particularly lymphopenia, uh, Raynaud's phenomenon, which is a particularly cold-induced discoloration of the hands, uh, or feet more commonly than other areas such as the nose or ears. Um, serositis, which means that any serous surface can be inflamed, which leads to symptoms uh, specific to whichever surface is involved. So in the lungs, it's pleurisy. In the heart, it's pericarditis. Even in the abdomen, it can be serositis or peritonitis. Um, also, less than 10 to 30% present with uh, neurologic involvement have oral ulcers, alopecia, or thrombocytopenia. But these are all possible uh, areas of concern with time. And even more uncommon at presentation, less than 10% of cases uh, are lymphadenopathy, discoid lesions, and we'll talk about that in a minute, sick of symptoms, which refers to dry eyes and dry mouth. Livido reticularis uh, refers to the lacy uh, purplish discoloration uh, that's visible in the skin. Um, and hemolytic anemia, of course, is uh, immunologically based rupture of red cells. Thrombosis or clotting, uh, what we call subacute cutaneous lupus, which I'll talk about in a moment. Actual lung involvement as opposed to serous involvement. Uh, urticaria, which is um, uh, a specific cutaneous manifestation in a small percentage of patients. And then uh, purpura, which reflects uh, vasculitis or inflammation of small blood vessels. So this is a wide array of complaints. And if you think about the permutations and combinations of these symptoms that are occurring over time, um, it's a dizzying uh, task to try to lay a diagnosis on someone. And I think uh, one of the things that I uh, was adamant about when I was uh, practicing was to be disciplined about believing the patient. And I have to tell you that um, I've had a number of young, youngish even, not so young, but often 20s, 30s who look very healthy and they come in with crazy diagnoses, that, I mean, crazy symptoms that don't seem to relate to each other. And the easiest thing to do is not believe them and think that they're looney tunes. 
Um, but you have to take every single complaint that someone brings to you at face value and ask yourself, can these be connected in some way? Might they have a systemic disease such as lupus? Now, um, this slide actually shows uh, not the symptoms and findings at presentation, but the wide array at any time of symptoms. Now, I'm not going to go through these, and the slides, uh, the slide is, it, it is probably hard to read, uh, but you can look at it when you get the slide deck. And I think this again emphasizes just how uh, protean the manifestations can be. And it emphasizes uh, the percent of patients at any time who will have this. Now, systemic manifestations, including fatigue, fever, and weight loss are very important to ask about uh, because so many patients have those. And in the absence of having those over time, it's really hard to imagine that a patient is suffering from a, a disease that's so uh, generalized and systemic. But read through all these, and, and if you have any questions about what these uh, represent or what symptoms these might uh, present with, uh, please feel free to ask me and I'll be happy to talk to you about them. Now, I view lupus as a, uh, basically a series of concentric circles, and um, this shows how they relate. Um, you can have patients with some uh, overlap or patients just with isolated ANA, arthritis, and serositis. You can have patients just with rashes or antibodies. It, it, you can see for yourself how overlapping it is, and this is probably not um, comprehensive, but it's a good visual, I think, on uh, the disease itself. Now, what I'm gonna do right now is fly, and I mean fly through some of the typical um, manifestations that you might see when someone comes into your office. Um, I think a patient with lupus uh, is really uh, visually often able to be diagnosed just by the way her skin looks. So patients can have a wide array of abnormal um, rashes and skin uh, findings, uh, most of which are reflected by this slide. Um, discoid lupus is something that you've all heard about, and I'm gonna come back to SCLE in just a moment. Um, discoid lupus can occur in about 15% of patients without any clinical manifestations, including without any serologic abnormalities. It is the finding that we'll see in a moment uh, heals with scarring. So patients who have discoid lupus, their lesions can resolve, but they always have often atrophy and um, hypopigmented skin in the area where there were discoid lesions. Um, malar rash is a very common finding. Uh, it's confined uh, to the butterfly distribution that you can see here, and it stops abruptly at the nasolabial fold. One difference between this rash and um, seborrheic dermatitis is that seborrhea goes right over the um, nasolabial fold and is much more widespread. But this is very clearly uh, a butterfly uh, distribution, which is highly suggestive of lupus. Um, alopecia is a finding. We'll see some findings of cutaneous vasculitis in a moment. I've um, put in yellow the things that are really make you very suspicious. And palatal ulcers in my practice and in, in the literature as well is something that really uh, should be carefully considered and looked for because if you don't open a patient's mouth and look at the palate, you're gonna miss it. But patients with palatal, palatal ulcers uh, awful, often will have a lupus. And I've had patients who've actually had biopsies and some have shown findings of vasculitis of the palate. Um, Patients can have bullous lupus and also frequent aphthous ulcers. So here comes the slideshow that's gonna race through these. And uh, this is the malar rash that we talked about. Um, this is a patient with discoid lupus and we can see the hypopigmentation here uh, in an area where she had uh, a, a discoid lesion. And you can, you can really just imagine here that this area is very atrophic in a lesion that's healing. And this can be very scarring. And it's generally often completely all over the scalp. And of course, it, 
often is provoked by sun exposure. Now the, the condition that we call subacute cutaneous lupus um, heals, but it never leaves a scar when it heals. That's one of the biggest differences between it and discoid lupus. Plus, it often has a psoriaform appearance, scaly, serpiginous borders, um, and it can occur on the face, the extremities, the chest. Um, this lesion is associated with uh, neonatal lupus, uh, and people with this lesion often have a certain antibody called anti rho antibody, which we will get to in, in a moment. This is a patient with typical sun, in, sun exposed uh, lupus, malar rash. You see, it's avoiding the uh, nasolabial fold, but most other parts of her chin. Interesting, I'm not sure why this uh, was not involved. Um, she has it on her neck as well. And this is a perfect example of the effects of sun on the skin. So this is obviously where her bathing suit was. And, you know, I've seen patients who've gone to Florida and for the very first time had um, exposure to extensive exposure to sun who developed rashes like this. And it's hard to treat this. This again is a patient with photosensitivity of the face and the neck, very uh, compelling uh, example of non-sun exposed skin and sun exposed skin. And this is an example of bullous lupus. And patients with um, generalized uh, lupus, like that's bullous lupus are very sick. And all of these lesions, uh, if they uh, rupture can become infected. And this is really a, often leads to hospitalization if there are uh, diffuse bullous lesions all over the body, such as uh, I've seen on a couple of occasions. Um, here's a patient with alopecia. And uh, it can involve uh, generalized uh, scalp alopecia particularly, but also some localized lesions where you can see very little um, hair. And uh, this uh, takes weeks to months to improve but it's highly suggestive as well of lupus. There are other causes of alopecia, hypothyroidism, um, alopecia areata, et cetera, but this is certainly one to consider. And sometimes there are scaly uh, subacute cutaneous lesions in areas of alopecia. Here's an example of some of the palatal ulcers that if you don't look for, you won't see. And there's also some involvement of the tongue here. Before I leave the skin, I'll tell you that our, our friends, the dermatologists can be extremely helpful because they can biopsy uh, certain lesions in lupus and there's typical pathology, but I promised you that I wasn't gonna show you pathology and I wasn't gonna show you um, pathophysiology on this particular lecture. I'd happy to do it some other time, but I just can't get through the whole thing. I restricted this to clinical findings, but. Um, sharing a patient who has cutaneous lesions with a dermatologist is a good idea, not only because they may be helpful with diagnosis, but also management. Um, this is a patient who had a typical Palmer erythema and a digital involvement from lupus that we all often see, sort of a motley discoloration. And you can see this uh, interdigital um, dermatitis. Um, this has to be distinguished from uh, conditions such as um, um, dermatomyositis, but the dermatitis uh, over, is over the joints uh, when we have dermatomyositis instead of uh, interdigitally like this. And these are little um, tiny uh, digital infarcts um, that um, suggest uh, that the patient has um, vasculitis. We're getting a lot of chats here. Let me just see if we have anything that needs to be. Oh, people are signing on. Welcome. Um, this will be um, available both via slides and also via um, uh, other ways. Um, it's been recorded so uh, you can catch up as we uh, go through these. Uh, and this is an extreme case of, of gangrene, uh, which I've seen one case of. In fact, I got um, stopped by the highway patrol when that patient was, uh, she was hospitalized and she ultimately died. And I, it's the only time I've ever run through a, um, a highway patrol roadblock. <laughs> so it was 
definitely bad for her, but also bad for me. Um, uh, and she died. This is obviously a life-threatening situation. Um, now, I just rushed through uh, cutaneous lupus, but I will say that um, as we've seen, most patients at some time or another will have cutaneous manifestations. So just be on the lookout for it. And if somebody comes to you complaining of skin rashes, that certainly could be, could be uh, lupus. Now, a, a hallmark of lupus, which is why rheumatologists have the honor of taking care of these patients in addition to the immunologic process uh, is uh, musculoskeletal involvement. Now, lupus is definitely in about 90% of patients uh, different than the rheumatologic involvement in rheumatoid arthritis. And these first two words, non-erosive and non-deforming are the main way that rheumatoid arthritis differs from lupus because rheumatoid arthritis, and I hope that you have learned, uh, is typified by erosive deforming arthritis. Now there can be an overlap between lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And we can call this quote, rupus close quote. I think diagnosing someone with rupus is uh, something for the rheumatologist, but it's just an interesting fact to know. And you can, in a small number of patients, have erosive disease. And you certainly can have uh, synovitis with effusions like you do in uh, rheumatoid. But for the most part, uh, it's painful. Uh, it interferes with function, but it's non-erosive and non-deforming. Um, it is associated with morning stiffness. There are many ways in which it's very similar. And there is an overlapping positivity of rheumatoid factor in a small uh, number of patients with, um, with uh, lupus. Uh, there is a condition called Jacquard's arthropathy. Now, I'm going to ask you at the end of the talk if you know of any other conditions besides lupus which might be associated with Jacquard's arthropathy. So make a note of that, and then I will turn off my slide sharing and see if anybody knows the answer at the end of the talk. But what Jacquard's arthropathy is, is deforming arthritis secondary to tendinopathy with reducible subluxation. So if you see someone with rheumatoid arthritis who has really advanced hand deformities, they are generally not reducible because the deformities are on the basis of joint erosive arthritis. So, and often with a subluxation, often with fusion, osteophytes, secondary osteoarthritis, et cetera. But Jacquard's arthropathy, as we'll see in a moment, is not associated with those findings. And it, you can simply take the patient's uh, digits and reduce the hands to looking exactly in the hand, in the case of hand involvement, like my hands are your hands. Uh, so the arthritis is due to tendinopathy and uh, corrective surgery can be done to reduce the tendinopathy and help patients be more func functional. The one thing you should remember, and I've seen this too, I think I've seen all this, but I obviously had an enriched practice with regard to lupus. But keep an eye out for a patient who has only one large joint involved and also has a suspected or definite diagnosis of lupus because they may come to you having a history of having taken steroids in the past and they may have uh, osteonecrosis, which is also known as, known as avascular necrosis, either secondary to lupus or secondary to a past history of corticosteroid use. Okay, so let's talk about what Jacquard's arthropathy looks like. So this was a patient who had lupus and this is the way that her hand looked. Um, extensive deformity, right? And so you would expect that her hand x-ray were she a patient with rheumatoid arthritis would look very abnormal. But if you look at these joints, they are pristine. I don't see one erosion. I see normal joint space, maybe a little bit of periarticular osteopenia. But these joints look pristine. And when I took these individual digits, I was able to completely extend them into normal position and the, the digits looked normal. Um, there may have been some synovitis across the MPs. They certainly look a bit puffy, but um, the main finding here is that the joints themselves appear normal. 
Now, lupus is known for in, involving the um, cardiovascular structures. So pericarditis can be a problem uh, presenting with chest pain without effusion or with effusion, even tamponade. So a patient with pericarditis and, who comes and says they calls in the middle of the night and says they absolutely cannot breathe um, or has other symptoms to suggest pericarditis, that is a medical emergency. Get them to the ER pronto. They can have myocarditis. They also can have valvular lesions uh, such as Liebman Sachs endocarditis that we often see in antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And um, oops, sorry, I'm trying to get back so I can see the whole slide. Uh, coronary vasculitis uh, is present uh, sometimes. And accelerated atherosclerosis, a secondary to steroids is, uh, or secondary to underlying disease is a common cause of death, which is what that says down here. It's a, one of the common causes in patients with lupus for, who've had it for many years. So you really have to be cautious about um, patients uh, presenting with chest pain who are in their 40s. Uh, just an anecdote, I had one patient who had definite lupus, had many different disease manifestations, and I followed her um, antibody status over many moons, and it turned out one day she showed up, and uh, her antibody status was sky high, and she was not having um, much in the way of symptoms, and within a month, she had uh, a myocardial infarction, her very first one, and this type of prodrome of antibodies that waxed and waned, but tended, uh, particularly anti-DNA antibodies that um, shot up uh, indicative of increased activity of lupus in her case, were, was a prodrome for several um, subsequent myocardial infarctions. Um, I've mentioned that you can see um, pu many pulmonary manifestations. I think pleuritis is the most common, and uh, there can be um, effusions or not. Uh, obviously, pleuritis is um, manifest by pain when one breathes. Um, there can be huge, massive effusions. And uh, one time I got called down to the ER to see a lady, and uh, I was so pleased that I was able to use my, my uh, clinical skills, and I was able to define her um, pleural effusion, which was all the way up to the middle of her lung field, just by palpation and by thumping and uh, I hadn't seen that in quite a while. Um, and she'd almost whited out her, her involved lung. And she's, she did great. She's, she's done wonderful, but she had stuttering. Um, she had several organs involved when she presented and she had stuttering manifestations over many, many moons. Um, patients can get uh, pulmonary alveolitis or vasculitis, which can lead to um, pulmonary hemorrhage and hemoptysis. And they also can get what's called shrinking lung, lung syndrome. This is hard to diagnose. Uh, it is diagnosed largely through pulmonary function tests and it's due to muscle dysfunction and it leads to restrictive lung disease. So patients don't have the strength to expand their lungs and they, this exists over time and the lungs basically just shrink, shrink, shrink and they have a, a restrictive lung disease. They can also get uh, bronchiolitis obliterans uh, or otherwise known as BOOP, although this is an uncommon manifestation. Now, this is an example of, of a um, vegetation in a patient uh, who uh, had embolic disease, little flecks of these um, uh, left their point of origin and caused some very small um, strokes. Uh, Liebman Sachs endocarditis is associated with positive uh, antiphospholipid antibodies. Also, the talk uh, that I, I'll give at another time is just too much to, uh, to do it all. Um, the feared complication of lupus, uh, among others, is actually uh, renal disease. Um, about half of patients at some time or another will have it. And fortunately, most are asymptomatic. Um, however, um, patients often will develop hypertension, edema, um, active urinary sediment, proteinuria, and eventually as well, particularly if they have um, certain kinds of um, diffuse disease in their uh, kidneys, will have a, a renal insufficiency, 
and evolve into renal failure. The um, edema often occurs in patients with membranous sclerulonephritis and relates to albuminuria and sometimes massive hypoalbuminemia. Um, the active urinary sediment, the proteinuria, the hypertension we often see in diffused um, proliferative glomerulonephritis. And this is a summary uh, of the different types of disease that one uh, might see. The class three and class four is really the most um, concerning, particularly class um, four. Uh, that occurs in about 25% of all biopsies and that really mandates uh, aggressive treatment. Again, uh, as far as following patients and sharing them with other specialists, um, we'll talk more about that at the end of the talk. But if you have a patient in whom you suspect lupus, and, and again, we'll go over this at the end of the talk, um, you should follow their, check their urinalysis and follow it regularly. And if you see them develop any abnormality suggesting renal involvement, then getting uh, a, a nephrologist involved would be helpful. Hopefully by then uh, a rheumatologist would already be involved too. And this is a example of a red blood cell cast in urine. And obviously this uh, is pathognomonic for glomerulonephritis um, because this is a, a literally a cast of one of the uh, renal tubules. Um, more recently, uh, diffuse nervous system involvement has been identified in lupus, uh, manifesting as seizures, headache, stroke syndromes, sometimes even subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, people who take care of patients like this long enough see transverse myelitis, an MS-like disorder, including um, um, abnormal MRIs, optic neuritis, they can get aseptic meningitis, um, peripheral neuropathy, cranial neuropathy, mononeuritis multiplex, in which there's one nerve supplying one muscle that leads to muscle dysfunction, such as a wrist drop, or a foot drop um, occurs. And uh, lupus can cause Guillain-Barre syndrome or a syndrome that looks very similar to it, which is a um, additive um, distal progressive up to proximal uh, peripheral um, neuropathy. Um, they can get ataxia, rigidity, chorea, uh, hemibolismus, and patients with lupus frequently have psychiatric disorders. And this is problematic because some of them are on high doses of prednisone, which can also cause um, psychiatric disorders. Uh, they can get dementia and coma. So just looking at this list, uh, this is enough to keep a neurologist busy for a long time. So um, the rheumatologist and the primary care physician often play um, as the central referring magnet and then depending upon which system seems to be most involved or involved at the time, get other people involved to help. This is an example of a sural nerve. Uh, and you can see that there's onion skinning and there's infiltrates in the wall of the uh, vessel, plus the lumen is completely occluded. These are more normal. And um, this uh, is an example of a biopsy of the sural nerve in a patient with um, uh, mononeuritis multiplex. Um, this is an abnormal MRI, uh, T2 weighted and not, and you can see this huge, huge area of, of, of involvement. It, it appears differently uh, um, depending upon which technique you use, but um, this patient was extremely symptomatic um, and actually had a, a dense stroke as a result of this. Um, the eyes are involved. So this is, these are called sotoid bodies that you can see on ocular exam. Um, these are retinal infarcts. Um, and um, likewise, you can see those as well. Uh, and this is papilledema uh, that can occur in patients with uh, lupus also. Uh, patients with ocular symptoms, again, I think the ophthalmologic uh, colleagues can be very helpful about that. Now, finally, I just wanted to mention briefly um, hematologic involvement. Uh, patients get leukopenia, particularly lymphopenia with a closed parentheses. I'll correct that one in the talk. They get thrombocytopenia, sometimes profound, but often slight, often in the 70, 80, 90 range. 
um, but autoimmune. They can get AIHA, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, bone marrow necrosis, in which all elements are involved, splenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, and also they get, which I didn't write down, uh, they get anemia of chronic disease. Uh, many of these women are menstruating women, so they can have iron deficiency, which adds to the confusion about what's called causing what. So there's some profound possible hematologic abnormalities that often are seen in this disease. So you have this patient, she comes in, she tells you how she feels, and you begin to suspect that she might have um, some immunologically based illness. Now, I don't like the term, quote, connective tissue disease, close quote, but it's still used. I think of the connective tissue diseases as diseases that really affect connective tissue like Marfan syndrome, but other people use it to refer to immunologically based illness. In any event, if you suspect an immunologic based illness, there are some other masqueraders, which we'll see, but we should pretend or look for uh, lupus and then go from there because lupus of all the diseases may be of the immunologically based illnesses may be the most important to diagnose uh, early with the exception of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so if a patient has symptoms to suggest um, serositis, you're going to order the ANA, but you're going to exclude other causes of that particular symptom or finding. And that's really the thrust of this slide. So if a patient has um, cytopenias, that patient may be taking drugs that cause cytopenia. So don't assume, even if the patient has known lupus or if the ANA comes back positive, don't assume that all of these findings could be due to lupus, but certainly um, consider other causes. And I think this is a very comprehensive slide to uh, support that approach. Um, so fever um, lasting more than three weeks, you have to test for viral infections, acute confusion, uh, that's an urgent problem. You need to check for CNS infections and, and do neuroimaging studies to make sure there are no uh, focal processes. A uh, patient with focal neurologic complaints, you can read this list as well as I, but all of these um, things could be caused by lupus, but many of them um, have uh, other possibilities that you need to consider. So these are two slides that I would definitely um, pay attention to. Now, and in the next hour, uh, Dr. Bernhard is going to give a talk on laboratory findings um, in immunologically based illnesses. And I'm pretty sure that he's going to spend some time talking about um, lupus uh, and ANA test techniques. But I wanted to also uh, mention this, uh, and I think you can't hear it often enough because it's often, um, for most people who aren't rheumatologists, uh, very confusing. So in the old days, um, most of the testing uh, for antinuclear antibodies was done using uh, the immunofluorescent technique. And many of you may have heard of the so-called double sandwich technique where you take a patient's serum and then you apply it to um, a slide that has some nuclei on it and uh, you wash it off and then you add another antibody to uh, immunoglobulin and that antibody is tagged with immunofluorescence. And if the patient has autoantibodies, the antibody that you add is going to stick. And the antibody that you add is tagged and it's going to fluoresce. So you get positive immunofluorescence. Um, it turned out early on, this was a, a sensitive way to diagnose lupus, but it really diagnosed way more than just lupus and it was not very specific. So 20% of normal patients had low titer uh, and 5% had um, some higher titers. Uh, that's not specific enough. So you certainly early on could not say that a patient with a positive ANA had lupus. And it, as it turns out, without doing more testing, you can't say that today. Um, and you also couldn't say um, that the patient did not have lupus if that were if the substrate was not these HEP2 cells, which are hepatoma cells 
And now the cell line that's always used to do the ANA testing is this particular cell line because it's extremely sensitive. So it picks up 95% of all patients with lupus will have some positivity of immunofluorescence. So now uh, what we do, um, most labs will, will do immunofluorescence, but I would encourage each of you to find out what kind of ANA test technique your lab does. And sometimes you'll have more than one option when you order using the computer. And you may unknowingly order the wrong one. And let me explain to you what I mean by the wrong one. Um, a long time ago at UMass, we used to do what was called a multiplex. Now, the multiplex did not have any immunofluorescence involved. What it did was um, there were coated beads and they were coated not with a pan um, panel of many different uh, nuclei, but with very specific antibodies. And so the person or company that provided the slides that were coated or, or the wells that had beads in them that were coated with antibodies made a panel of specific antibodies and you put the patient's serum, you exposed it to that panel. And if that test was positive, you would get very specific antibody information, but you would not get this um, traditionally reported immunofluorescence and the, the test that is 95% sensitive. In fact, it's not unthinkable, and it happened all the time, that if you only ordered something called the ANA choice by Quest, or you only ordered the multiplex, and different labs have different names for this type of approach, you might miss ANA positivity. And someone might say, well, is the ANA positive? And you would say, no, it's not positive. In contrast, if you did and were able to get the ANA by immunofluorescent technique, uh, the ANA would be positive, but you wouldn't have a clue what kind of positivity was leading to that positive ANA. So you really need both sets of information. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you about just right now. But before I get there, I wanna show you that if you, this came from a classic paper um, 18 years ago by Rob Smerling. And what he, what he um, showed and how he, this, this, what this depicts is that of all the patients who have a positive ANA, the gray area here are patients with uncertain clinical significance. The teeny little black sliver, teeny, are patients with rheumatic diseases. And you can see which ones they are. And the teeny little white sliver are patients with non-rheumatic diseases. And you can see what those are. Uh, Hashimoto's, Graves, autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, chronic infections, including hep C. So the moral of this slide is that if a positive ANA is done by this technique, which is immunofluorescence, it does not confirm the diagnosis of lupus because there's so many other things that can cause a positive ANA and the most common of which is nobody knows why there's a positive ANA. Now, it is possible that this is one point in time and over time, there may be findings that lead you to be able to confirm a rheumatic disease um, but um, the vast majority of patients will remain in this uncertain clinical significance group. Um, so this is an ANA by immunofluorescence. Um, so just be aware of that and study this slide and the concept of a positive ANA not confirming the diagnosis of lupus if it is done by immunofluorescence is something I want you to take home, okay? Now, Remember that I told you about individual antibodies that were coating beads and often different panels of antibodies, but they're clinically relevant. And these are, uh, or, I'm sorry, they're antigens and they're exposed to the patient's serum in an automated fashion. It takes two days or a day to get the test result back. And if it's a positive, it, it's reported to be positive if at least one of those wells um, develops and is present, is abnormal. Now, if this test is negative, there may be other ANAs besides the ones that are in the wells 
and it's still worth considering doing an immunofluorescence test. But the other thing to know is that specific identification of an antibody will not happen unless you order, if you have a positive ANA, what's called a reflex. Um, and this, this information is specific to UMass, but I think the generalization is, is still there. You have to know the method of ANA testing and you have to ask for all the information that it can, uh, it can give you. I think probably by the time I retired, uh, we had convinced UMass that it was uh, somewhat Neanderthal not to at least tell us what the MIA uh, anti antigen was that led to a positive test. But um, you have to be in touch with the lab if you have an unexplained positive test, if they don't, and have them go ahead and continue to test it. Um, very quickly, these are um, antibodies that um, are um, different patterns that one might see in um, immunofluorescence. This is a REM pattern associated with um, lupus nephritis. This is a homogeneous pattern and a speckled pattern, um, uh, a, a nuclear pattern, and this is a speckled pattern. And these all have clinical significance. Now, I wanna talk about specific antibodies, specific autoantibodies. Okay, so 98% of people who have an ANA done uh, by immunofluorescence here will have a positive ANA. It's not specific for lupus. So that's the group that we've just been discussing. Now, a positive anti-double-stranded DNA is highly specific, 95% specific for lupus, but it's not very, it's not very sensitive. So it's going to miss half of patients who have lupus, but if you have a positive anti-DNA and it's confirmed on repeat testing, you have a high likelihood of, if not having lupus now, of developing it. Now, antihistone often is, is tested in this way. Um, if you don't have a positive antihistone, um, or if you do, it's not, it's not at all specific for lupus, um, but it is specific for drug-induced lupus. So if you're thinking that a patient might have drug-induced lupus and you order this and uh, it's negative, they probably don't. Um, Anti-SM is the other, it's anti-Smith, is the other antibody that is highly specific, 99% specific for lupus. Um, so anti-Smith and anti-DNA are the take-home antibodies. These other uh, antibodies have other disease specificities as indicated here. And I'm just gonna leave you to your own devices to review those because we're talking about lupus today. But the other thing I wanted to tell you is lupus is a disease in which complement is consumed. Um, and I'll come to that in just a moment. But this slide simply confirms what we just talked about in different words, specific for lupus, specific for lupus, okay? And um, anti-Rho is associated with subacute cutaneous lupus. Uh, Anti-Rho and LA are also called SSA and SSB and they're associated with Sjogren's syndrome. And anti-RNP is associated with mixed connect connective tissue disease. But we're not talking about that today. What we're talking about is lupus. So these are the two antibodies that are specific for lupus. Um, I put this slide in there just not to go over the complement cascade, but to remind you that patients who have active lupus do consume complement components. And so we do follow often the third component of complement, the fourth component of complement, so C3 and C4 and also C1Q. And those are often consumed uh, in patients who have active uh, lupus, particularly renal disease. Okay, differential diagnosis. Um, these are all the things that could present in similar fashion. Uh, and how do, you, how do you distinguish? Well, first of all, you do a complete history, complete history. You ask about symptoms that are suggestive of lupus, ask about other symptoms that aren't. You ask about systemic symptoms, and uh, you are careful to ask about symptoms referable to multiple organs. Um, you also look very carefully for physical findings of lupus. These days, uh, in physical exam has sort of been a forgotten art 
but you want to listen for murmurs to see if they have Lehman Sachs endocarditis. You want to look under their fingernails to see if they have any infarcts. You want to look in their conjunctivae to see if they have conjunctival inf infarcts. Just go through a complete physical exam like you're a second year medical student or a second year um, um, nurse practitioner student. Um, you're going to want to order some screening studies, CBC, said rate, CRP, both inflammatory markers, UA. And if they do have uh, joint symptoms, which most do, you're going to order a rheumatoid factor, an anti-cyclic uh, citrullinated protein, and an ANA. Now, I've I put in capital letters, please understand the technique that your lab uses. I would be happy if you have questions about what your lab is testing to go over it with you. So if you wanna reach out to me uh, after this talk, um, I'm sure that the Maven people can get you in touch with me and I can easily uh, try to explain to you what they're doing and what your testing uh, means. But if you get a positive ANA by IFA, you wanna order what's called a precipitin panel if the initial test doesn't provide this or if the IFA is positive or if it's negative and the clinical suspicion is high. Um, there is a very, very low likelihood that an INA, which is negative by IFA, um, is uh, associated with lupus. It's not zero, but it's very close to, to zero. Now, as far as following the patient, you're going to follow them over time because lupus develops over time. So you're going to follow a CBC, a UA, a C4, uh, and a SED rate as appropriate, but most importantly, following clinical symptoms. I think it's worth it to become a partner with your rheumatologist if you have one available as early in the process as possible. Uh, the rheumatologist may say this patient doesn't need to be seen back again, or, or he or she does need to be seen back again, but uh, they are the experts at diagnosing this disease. Um, now, the other thing is, I know that many of you might be family practitioners, and pregnancy is a very special consideration in people who have possible or definite SLE. So it's very important if you have a patient that you think might have lupus who's pregnant to get them in and confirm the pregnancy status and get them in with the rheumatologist um, and or a high-risk OB um, very, very early. Okay, so let's go back to our case. Uh, I've gone over the cases and I'm going to tell you now the serologies. So the first case had an ANA by IFA of 1 to 2560 in a speckled pattern, and she had a positive anti-Smith. Now, oh, Dr. Upchurch said that a positive anti-Smith is 99% specific for lupus. Wow. So we would say, given these symptoms, that she has lupus. She has synovitis, she has alopecia, she has joint pain and fatigue. So she has a, a definite lupus. And one could argue that this MCV of 110 could either be folate deficient, or I would be more concerned given the low platelet count that she has autoimmune hemolytic anemia and would do these uh, testing to confirm that. Now, the second patient, you may have thought about lupus, but you ordered an ANA and she had an A and A that was positive one to 160. She had fatigue, but she had myalgia. She didn't have arthralgias. And she had a scaly rash that, that uh, basically crossed the nasolabial fold. She was not photosensitive, which we would expect her to be. And she had um, diffuse muscle and joint tenderness. So probably uh, it's reasonable to order an A and A, but this A and A, I could say with uh, a high degree of certainty right now is not suggestive of lupus, particularly because the specific antibody tests were negative and her CBC was normal. So once again, she probably fell into this very small white group of non-rheumatic diseases or more, more, more probably into this uncertain clinical significance, I would say maybe a fibromyalgia or something like that. That's for, again, for another a topic of consideration. So the, the answers to some of my questions that I posed early on are, there are certain autoantibodies that can diagnose lupus with certainly, certainty, but not nearly all positive ANAs are, are indicative of lupus. 
and many more are not than in fact are. Uh, the one last slide I'm gonna um, introduce you to is this uh, concept of criteria that I'm sure many of you have heard. When you see a patient who has lupus, I bet a lot of you um, scurry and try and find the most um, uh, up-to-date criteria. And it happens to be uh, the 2019 uh, ULAR ACR lupus criteria. And in this particular scenario, you have to have an ANA that's positive at at least one to 80 on hep, hep two cells, else you can't even get into the um, diagnostic algorithm. Uh, and in this case, if you, if you have 10 points, you're said to have um, actual uh, de definite lupus. Now this is, this is used to make studies of lupus homogeneous so that every patient in which a conclusion is derived about treatment or clinical course or whatever actually has lupus. So this assigns uh, weighted values um, to the symptoms of a number of different domains. And even just reviewing the domains, it gives you the sense of what a protean illness this is. Um, turns out 10 is the uh, 10 point tal tally is definite. Um, but people can change. So I encourage people to uh, follow uh, patients with lupus over time along with their rheumatologist. Final thought, two important caveats about diagnosing lupus. In our opinion, according to this author, and I completely agree, nobody should receive a diagnosis of lupus if there are no disease findings. I don't care if the anti-double-stranded DNA or the anti-Smith is positive if there are no disease symptoms or findings. Autoantibody combinations may eventually be found to predict future disease, and this then might invite early therapeutic measures in the future, but there is no disease, no disease without symptoms. Um, so I think I have to stop and I would encourage you to review the slides and the references and then get off this talk and go listen to Dr. Gerson's talk. Uh, and then um, if you have any questions, um, I can stick around for a while, but I think hearing his talk would probably cement some of the things that I've said um, more than staying here with me. And you can submit them via the chat and then Ryan, um, who's our technological guru, can give them to me later and I can get them back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Upchurch. Yeah, she said it best. If you have any questions, um, what I'll do is I'll throw Jill Einstein's link in the chat. You can message her and we'll forward it over to Dr. Upchurch. But I think you'll be better off going over to Dr. Uh, Bernhard's talk, which just for reference is on a separate link. So you will need to leave this meeting and join it. I believe an email just went out with that. So thanks again to everyone. Um, and hopefully you enjoy the next talk. And if you do have any questions you want to get out, feel free to just say it here as well. So does anybody want to stick around just for a little while and ask me any questions? Um, I would encourage you to say no and to go to his talk, but if, if you can't do both and you have another two minutes, I can take a few questions. Uh, if you do have a question, you are on mute, um, so you will need to unmute yourself. Okay. Well, listen, um, I really am uh, appreciative to all of you for um, joining us here, and I uh, hope it's not too hot out there and hope there's not a lot of smoke. Uh, we've had rain every day for the last two weeks, three weeks almost, with the exception of one pretty week recently. So uh, we're, we're, we're thinking about you, but you think about us. We just have a slightly different uh, oppressive summer manifestation this year. Bye. Take care, everyone.